joining joining today's presentation on infrastructure opportunities in Central America. I am Brian Goldfinger, the Trade Americas team leader for Central America and a commercial officer from the U.S. Department of Commerce, currently based in Dallas, Texas. Before we begin, and as participants continue logging on, I'd like to cover just a, a few housekeeping details. Um, first, you're all in listen-only mode. Um, you can type any questions that you have in the Q&A section uh, on the right side of your screen, and we will address all of those questions um, at the end at the end of the presentations. If we're able to just give you a quick answer in the chat, we'll do so. Um, but otherwise, we'll wait for all of the presenters to, to speak, and then we'll address questions at the end. Uh, we are recording this webinar, so if anybody objects to that, please feel free to disconnect. Um, and also, the recording of this webinar will be sent out to all registered participants in, uh, in the coming days. Um, I'd also like to take just a second to share some quick background information about the U.S. and Foreign Commercial Service, any of you who might not be familiar with our organization. We're located across the United States and in U.S. embassies and consulates in nearly 80 countries. Our global network of trade professionals helps U.S. businesses to explore markets around the world and connect with pre-screened, qualified potential business partners. Whether you're looking to make your first export sale or expand to additional international markets, we offer the trade counseling, market research, business matchmaking, and commercial diplomacy that you need to connect with lucrative business opportunities around the world. The U.S. Commercial Service has organized this infrastructure webinar series focused on upcoming infrastructure projects in Latin America. Uh, we'll be discussing projects announced by different governments in the region to stimulate their economies. The projects represent fantastic opportunities for U.S. companies in different sectors, uh, which you all know what they are. These are opportunities for architectural services, engineering services, construction equipment, building products, et cetera. Uh, we see hundreds of these projects spanning airports, ports, transportation, housing, telecom, energy, and environmental technologies. To tackle this subject today, uh, we have a fantastic lineup of presenters. First, uh, Eric Wolf, our regional senior commercial officer at the U.S. Embassy in San Jose, Costa Rica, will provide us with some opening remarks um, and an overview of the Central American market as a whole. Following Eric, Ricardo Cardona, the senior commercial specialist also at the Embassy in San Jose, will dive deeper into specific upcoming projects in Costa Rica. Then we'll hear from Rosana Lobo, the senior commercial specialist at the U.S. Embassy in Honduras regarding upcoming projects there. Uh, for El Salvador, Maria Rivera, our senior commercial specialist in San Salvador, will present upcoming projects and a market overview for that country. And finally, we'll have Antonio Prieto, Libby Mota, and Leonel Torriello providing a market overview and details on the interoceanic uh, corridor project in Guatemala. The following, again, following all the presentations, I'll provide uh, some quick information regarding upcoming webinars and virtual events before we address all of the questions submitted during the presentation. So without further ado, I will hand this over to Eric Wolf to get us started. Eric, you can begin. Okay. Um, yes, um, uh, thank you, Brian. Hopefully you all can hear me. Uh, welcome to everyone. Okay, very good. Uh, I'm in kind of a public location, so forgive me if uh, there's a little bit of noise. Um, no, I thought I'd just start uh, with a brief overview of Central America, which uh, includes the countries of Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Belize, and, and Panama as well. Um, and overall, Central America, if you want to do next slide, Brian, um, uh, Central America represents a very important destination for U.S. exporters. Uh, it's uh, in one more slide too, uh, to the next one. Thank you. Uh, it, Central America is a natural uh, market uh, by geographic proximity to the United States that has a lot of cultural and economic ties. Uh, of course, one of the key drivers for export growth has been uh, the U.S. Central America Dominican Republic Free Trade Agreement, uh, also affectionately known as CAFTA-DR, uh, which dates back to the mid-2000 timeframe. Uh, 
Uh, this is actually a, a trade agreement uh, that has worked very, very well for the United States. Uh, currently, uh, actually, as of 2019, uh, the U.S. enjoys a $6.8 billion with the B trade surplus uh, kept to DR countries uh, as tariffs uh, have come down to uh, very low levels, in fact, down to zero for many uh, HSOs. Uh, this is a region that has uh, around 40 million people altogether. And as a region, this is very impressive, um, uh, accounts for about uh, about 40 percent of the imports are actually from the United States. Now, um, this slide here talks a bit. I just want to give some context to trade with Central America um, uh, and compare it to other regions of the world. Central America, from an, an export standpoint, is actually uh, larger in size than Chile uh, and has just surpassed India, uh, if you can believe that, in, in terms of size. This is very impressive, and um, we're going to hear in a few minutes a bit more detail from some key professionals um, uh, about the, um, uh, the individual countries within Central America, as well as opportunities in the infrastructure and construction sector. Um, and we're also going to hear a little bit later about, uh, about deal team. Um, but again, I do want to, um, I'm very excited. We have a fantastic team, Ricardo, uh, Cardona, Rosana, uh, Libby, and Antonio, uh, Maria are all going to, they're really the true experts. They're our deal team members. They, they have kind of the eyes and ears on the ground, and I'm looking forward to a very good uh, discussion. Um, but but I do want to just also mention that that um, there you know construction infrastructure there's a lot of fundamental reasons why we're excited about this sector but uh, it's not just limited to that Central America also represents a very impressive export market uh, for other sectors um, as well so again um, thank you for joining this we're going to be um, I think this is going to be a great webinar uh, and uh, we look forward to some some good, uh, productive interaction. So without further ado, um, I am going to now turn things over to um, uh, my colleague, Senior Commercial Specialist Ricardo Cardona, to share a bit more background um, uh, in Costa Rica. Ricardo? Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning if you are connecting from Central America. Thanks, Eric. It is my honor to talk about uh, Costa Rica market and, and the opportunities that may represent for the U.S. company in this country. Uh, first of all, uh, let me check uh, if I can see correctly. The Yes, perfect. Um, Costa Rica is located in the southern part of Central America region between uh, Nicaragua and Panama. The Costa Rica efforts to promote the country as a business and tourism destination, which started pretty much uh, three decades ago, along with their stable uh, democracy and well-educated population has been transformed an agriculturally based economy into a service-based and technology exporter economy. Tourism is relevant for the country and several international companies have established service center in the country to serve uh, their growth in the other Latin American markets. Costa Rica has the highest GDP in the Central America region with pretty much uh, um, $12,000 uh, 12, um, during 2019 with ports in both uh, coast and two major airports, one in the Central Valley, but is located that two thirds of the population and other close to the major tourism development area and in another part of the country in Liberia. In terms of energy, the country has a clear commitment to renewable sources of energy. With the opening of the hydroelectrical project Reventazon in 2017, Costa Rica reached during that year uh, 98 percent generation from renewable sourcing. The United States is the largest trading partner to Costa Rica with uh, 40 percent of the imports and 53 of the foreign direct investment come from the U.S. Costa Rica obviously and the U.S. have a strong 
economic and cultural ties. Talking about, uh, now speaking about construction and infrastructure, uh, most of these numbers that you will see in, in, uh, in the economic part and the, the projects that we are seeing actually are pre-pandemic. But, uh, but actually, the construction sector growth during 2018, based on the, on the permits uh, requested to the government, uh, implies a, a sector growth by around two, uh, 20 uh, 23% of increase during last year, recovering from uh, two declining years, triggered basically by um, private residential construction, which represents pretty much a 45% of the, of the, the total construction. Commercial, industrial, offices, and others represent the other 55%. For 2000. 20, the sector was expected to de de accelerate a little bit due, due to the changes in the building material cost as a result of the inclusion, inclusion of the lease of the building materials subject to the value added tax. But uh, definitely uh, it was expected uh, a good year. But uh, definitely uh, pandemic has been changing the landscape for for the entire globe. And right now, infrastructure is falling behind in roads, bridges, and at municipality level as part of the emergency measures to face the pandemic. However, we understand that public transportation represents a, an interesting opportunity and definitely will be a priority for the current administration as part of their economic reactivation measure, measures. This has been a, a relevant topic during the pandemic uh, and media, and train initiatives has been a flagship project for this administration led by the First Lady uh, Claudia Dobles. Three initiatives compound the, <coughs> sorry, this, pro this project at this moment, a new electric uh, passenger train, the improvement of the freight train that serves the Atlantic coast of the country, and also the improvement of the Pacific coast train that will allow to reconnect this coast to the Central Valley. Other uh, initiatives that we will be, uh, we are expecting that will survive the post pandemic um, uh, times are ambitious, like a development uh, project that includes a new passenger uh, terminal and the Port of Limon, which also will include a, mar a marina and a free trade zone. The expansion of the current uh, airport that serves uh, the metropolitan area of San Jose uh, will be extended. It's estimated useful life to allow the construction and the future of a new metropolitan air uh, airport. All these projects will be, uh, will be executed using a public-private partnership regulated by a legal framework currently in place in the country. Next slide, please. Please allow me to elaborate a little bit more on the two main uh, uh, train initiatives. First of all, the, the San Jose Inner Urban Electric Train with an estimated total investment of $1.4 billion. The project will be uh, conducted under the uh, a public-private partnership and counts with a feasibility and demand uh, study right now. The Central America Bank for Economic Integration, CAVE, has approved a 450 million, which represents the Costa Rica government portion in a potential partnership. Uh, the U.S. Uh, Department of Commerce is working to facilitate consortiums of U.S. companies interested to participate in a tender that is expected late this year to start works in 2021 or 2022. Um, the second project that is actually uh, on, on, on the way now is the improvement of the current train in, in Limon. TELCA, which is the acronym in Spanish for an electric train that will be substitute uh, the current diesel operation serving the, the Atlantic coast of the country and, and the Limon port that will connect the northern lands with the port where pass 80% uh, of the country's international train. 
this project is is estimated in in four hundred forty million dollars will will include a new uh, one hundred eighty kilometers of catenary lines and fifty bridges, pretty much. A tender is expected for late this year to initiate works in 2021. I will encourage uh, people interested to contact your U.S. Export Assistance Center near to your location and we'll be working as a team to support you uh, with the projects of your interest. So this is what I have. So let me introduce my colleague, uh, Mrs. Rosanna Lobo, the Senior Commercial Specialist with our Foreign Commercial Service in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. Thank you very much. Rosanna, are you there? Rosanna, I think you might be on mute still. Okay, it looks like Rosanna might be having might might be having some technical difficulties. Looks like she came off mute, but we still can't hear you. So uh, for now, should we move on to the next presenter? Um, so that would be. Uh, Maria Rivera in El Salvador. If Diego, if you can skip forward to her slides. Um, Maria, are you are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? This yeah, is Maria sorry. Rivera from El Salvador. Okay. We, so we can hear thank you, you so much for great. Thank you. Thank you so much for your attention. My name is Maria Rivera and, and I am the commercial specialist in El Salvador. Um Salvador is also located you know, in the heart of Central America, like every other country uh, in Central America, which makes us um, a good region to do business because of our location and our ports and airports that are interconnected. So um, the Salvadoran government, in addition to being the center of Central America, has a free market economy, which um, connects us with uh, countries there are key to our economies like Mexico, uh, Dominican Republic, Panama, Chile, through free trade agreements, as well with uh, the United States through the CAFTA free trade agreement. And El Salvador also has a uh, an agreement with EU, EU, the European, uh, the Europeans, and it's a member of the WTO member. Uh, it's a member of the WTO. I'm sorry. Um, this is just to clarify how open the economy is. We're open for trade, and this is where um, projects take place in terms of competition more so than favoritism. Uh, remittances uh, are very important for El Salvador. Uh, we have like 20% uh, of our GDP. Um, comes in from remittances, sovereigns living abroad, many of them in the United States, which th makes us um, very familiar and give us another tie to the U.S. economy, to the U.S. culture, to the U.S. language, to the U.S. business um, style. Um, in this um, Slide, you can see some of the GDP just uh, to illustrate the size of the government in terms of the size of the country in terms of macroeconomics. But I think that um, some of the benefits that El Salvador really offers to trade is that the country continues, despite the COVID pandemic, to um, to promote the purchase power, the um, public partnerships as a way to um, develop projects, key projects that are related to logistics um, in, in terms of construction, machinery, and professional business. This is a good news because uh, some of the countries are having, are having to relocate funds to phase um, the COVID pandemic, but in the case of El Salvador, um, we're going to take 
or the country is going to take advantage of the experience in public-private partnerships. Um, most of the products that El Salvador imports and services are U.S. origin. Those enter free um, of duty due to the free trade agreement CAFTA. Um, and um, for this, uh, for this uh, presentation, I'm going to focus on the top infrastructure projects that are really sustained or uh, studied by um, through the public-private partnership. Uh, this four projects that you see on the slide are projects whose um, studies have already been advanced, well advanced, in some cases are finished, and we're just waiting for to go out into a public bidding process. For example, the Pacific Corridor, it's a road that connects the Acajutla port to the border with Guatemala. It's a key road for logistics. There's a lot of uh, trailer and freight forwards moving through that. Um, all of the studies have been done with the support of the Millennium Challenge account to turn this um, segment of the highway into a toll road. And um, it is expected that uh, some $80 million will be invested by the private company that decides to participate in this project. And consequently, this would be, you know, a project to, to become a modern project, competitive project would need um, equipment, technology to uh, to move in a in a fast manner the freight forward through there. Uh, there's another one, street lighting and video surveillance. This is 144 kilometers. That is um, um, but it's also in the final stages, ready to be published for public for a private investor. Um, the estimated investment is um, thirteen million dollars in in this um, road segment, and will require um, that the private partner takes or undertakes the finance and design, construction, installation, and maintenance of the infrastructure and services on those 145 kilometers, including the lighting, the video surveillance camera, the underground wiring, which is supposed to be fiber optic, uh, to connect those images to a monitoring room and uh, to operate the lighting system. This would be an exchange for the advertising rights adjacent to the road to be awarded before this um, fiscal year ends. Uh, we also have a cargo term terminal as well. All of the studies have been done and uh, soon, sometime in August, we should see the, uh, the announcement for to call private investors. This terminal has two phases, the modernization of the existing uh, infrastructure and the construction of new, um, of a new uh, terminal um, at the international airport. And it's estimated that the first phase will um, need like 100 point eight million dollars and the second phase will require investment of about 43. The second phase will be construction plus equipment. And then finally, this viaduct, which is new to us, it's a, it's a new project or a new way of, uh, of uh, building <laughs> roads uh, through this viaduct, which is 1.6 kilometers. The feasibility study is underway and loan approved from the CABE, which is the Central American Economic Development Bank, is 2,046 million. Um, this is one of the priority projects by that this government, that the current, current government has 
So this is another project that will require equipment, um, materials, designs, professional services. Next. Next slide, please. Thank you. Now we're all wondering what's happening with the economic in impact on, of COVID. IMF forecast a 5.4% GDP con contraction in 2020 for El Salvador. Um, the government of El Salvador is preparing stimulus packages for small and medium enterprises. And um, there's been a drop in tax revenue and remittances already, and it's that drop will continue for the rest of the year. And uh, this is why we in El Salvador are focusing on projects that are likely to happen in the next six months or a year, which are um, public-private partnerships. Um, Please let me know if you have any questions about this project. I think there's going to be lots of opportunities. Uh, we're working together with other agencies um, for companies for, to support companies. And um, we, you will have a chance to ask any questions you have about those projects through this conversation. This would be it from El Salvador, and with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague in Guatemala, Libby Mota. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Libby Mota. I'm the Commercial Specialist in Guatemala. Guatemala is a diverse country, very rich in natural resources, hardworking people, beautiful landscapes, and a strong growing economy in past years. Our strategic geographical position and connectivity provides a getaway to a large regional market for U.S. goods and services. Customs union between Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador represents commercial trade of more than $3,800 billion in 2019. As shown in the map, Guatemala has direct access to the coastline on both the Pacific and Atlantic Ocean and has the second largest sea freight operation in Central America. Guatemala is the largest economy in the region with a GDP of approximately 85 billion in 2019. The United States and Guatemala enjoy a growing trade relationship which became even stronger after the implementation of the CAFTA Free Trade Agreement. The United States is our largest commercial partner. U.S. merchandise exports to Guatemala were $6.8 billion in 2019. The preliminary data show that the flow of foreign direct investment totaled $998 million in 2019. Also, a key component to Guatemala's economy is remittances from migrants, most of whom have settled in the United States. In 2019, remittances increased by 12.9% and were equivalent to 13.8 percent of the GDP, a total of $10.5 billion. Next slide, please. Um, the government of Guatemala has set infrastructure development as a key target by focusing on development of projects that will stimulate the demand for infrastructure materials and services. The government announced a series of priority national development initiatives. Today, we are going to talk um, for two projects. The first one is the Guatemala Health Infrastructure for $234 million. As many other countries in the region, Guatemala has a limited hospital infrastructure, making it difficult to not only manage the current COVID-19 emergency, but also to treat the 17 million inhabitants. The situation is alarming since 75% of the population is served directly by the Ministry of Public Health and Social Assistance. In order to guarantee health protection, availability, access, and coverage of healthcare services, Guatemala Congress approved three loans for the ministry to design, build, expand, and equip nine national hospitals. Currently, our office in Guatemala is looking to get information on the tenders and the estimated guidelines for these. Project. Now, let me introduce you 
to Lionel Tariello, who is the CEO for SIGSA, who will be presented the Interoceanic Corridor Project. Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I uh, would like to thank first the United States Department of Commerce for uh, this opportunity to address such a distinguished audience. And I also would like to start by um, congratulating everyone here because uh, you have a, let's say, a, a front row seat to uh, a historical event. Uh, you're going to hear in the future a lot about this uh, Guatemala Interoceanic Corridor. It's uh, now in its international corporate birth, and I will try to walk you through in the uh, time allowed uh, through the main concepts of this uh, project. Please, the next uh, slide. Um, why a new global trade route? Basically because um, in, uh, in spite of the pandemic, we can foresee that in the next couple of decades, uh, the physical transportation of merchandise from all corners of the world is going to keep uh, on growing. In the past, it grew. In the past uh, decade, it grew at around 6% um, uh, annually. But this growth uh, is also facing some bottlenecks in the world. Please uh, uh, go to the next uh, uh, slide, the next slide. Uh, it's been growing at around 6.3 uh, annually in the past decade, and it's reached uh, 200 million uh, TEUs, uh, which stands for uh, 20 foot equivalent units or what is a standard container. Um, the um, projections are that uh, uh, a lot of these containers are to cross the isthmus of Central America. Uh, there is a strong uh, east-west trade that comes from uh, the eastern uh, coast of the United States towards uh, the Far East. That's the main uh, trade flow. Uh, but that's complemented with flows coming uh, in and out of um, connecting South America with uh, Europe and uh, other uh, routes that you see in this uh, little map over there. Please, the next slide. One of the problems is that uh, crossing the isthmus now faces uh, certain physical constraints. In search for economies of scale, um, exporters are looking for larger and larger ships, which uh, entail uh, smaller per unit uh, cargo uh, costs. And so uh, these larger ships are now uh, too big to cross the Panama Canal. And so um, options are being looked for. In the next slide, we will see, next slide, please that, uh, for instance, uh, the oil and liquid gas uh, tankers um, have given up going through the Panama Canal when it's uh, a matter of transporting a new oil uh, deposits uh, from the eastern shores of the continent to their natural markets in East Asia. Next slide, please. But in searching for those routes, you see the red lines over there, they have to face things such as bad weather in the southern tip of uh, Africa. Uh, <laughs> believe it or not, piracy problems when coming out of the Horn of Africa and uh, other bottlenecks in the eastern in the southeastern part of Asia to reach their destinations. If instead all this uh, new um, oil exporting or gas, uh, liquid gas exporting countries could cross the isthmus, for instance, through Guatemala, they would find a more tranquil and a direct route to their natural markets. Uh, this, in, in addition, would uh, entail um, a third less mileage, uh, and of course, all the savings that go associated with it, and in addition, less risk associated to those uh, problems mentioned before. Next slide, please. This, uh, in the current estimations uh, that have been given to us by our, um, technical advisors um, entailed savings, yearly savings uh, in transporting oil and liquid gas to the uh, East Asian markets of around 6 billion to China, 5 billion to Japan, and 3 billion to Korea per year. 
Um, so, so this is a very powerful incentives uh, for uh, different uh, producers, exporters in the world to uh, consider a different alternative. Please, the next slide. The um, solution is uh, this project we're presenting to you uh, today, uh, the Guatemalan Interoceanic Corridor, which essentially is a private interoceanic piece of real estate, and I stress private. This is not a government-owned project. This is a piece of real estate that has uh, mouths in both oceans, and it's uh, uh, 140 meters wide and 372 kilometers long. Uh, this, uh, please, next slide, um, corridor will have at both ends um, large uh, deep sea ports which can accommodate the kind of large ships, ultra large ships that make uh, interoceanic uh, um, a trade uh, economic and efficient. And in addition, it will have uh, accommodations for smaller ships that um, will enable the cabotage uh, uh, trading uh, to and from this uh, new hub. In addition, uh, this uh, port facilities will have connections for the ships to unload their oil and liquid gas into uh, pipelines that will cross the isthmus into the other ocean. In the process, in, the, in, 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 in between, there will be several uh, uh, free trade zones in which um, uh, different services, additional complementary services will be uh, uh, allowed to, to happen. Please, the next slide. Uh, this um, uh, project has been uh, in the making for the last 20 years. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, this, this corridor uh, will have um, uh, also um, highway, uh, and uh, it's already been uh, studied, uh, uh, studied uh, to the point that we have all the, all the topographical uh, um, information needed to uh, estimate the, the cost of the investment. Uh, as I said, we're considering uh, um, this uh, connection, multi-model connection, in addition to uh, a, a very uh, uh, substantial um, um, areas for uh, the industrial free trade uh, zones uh, to be located. Please, the next slide. In this fashion, uh, we uh, are aiming at making of Guatemala a new um, trading hub of a global scope, using essentially two uh, already existing technologies. The first one is the ability to make international computerized bookings of individual container uh, um, uh, trips. And that, in addition to new technology that enables us now to treat each container independent, not in a train or in a, in a um, um, set of uh, connected containers, but as an individual passenger. Please, the next uh, um, slide, please. We can see over here uh, a brief conceptual uh, description of the process uh, of the exporter Let's say in uh, Vietnam, it wants to sell some shoes to some clients in New York, in Rio de Janeiro, and in Venice. And then he sends four containers he can book uh, in regular, um, let's call them now flights, on a jumbo ship from, let's say, Tokyo uh, to Guatemala. And from there, each individual container will cross the isthmus in an individualized fashion and if it has to wait for its ship, it will have a, a parking spot while his ship arrives. And then the next leg of the trip will entail going out from Guatemala to, let's say, Rotterdam. And then from there to Venice. And, and the other containers will go to, uh, let's say, New York and Rio de Janeiro. In general, this system is conceived as a hub in which the exporter can book specific trips for each container and all of this will be uh, handled automatically through this technology. Please, the next slide. Uh, right now, in 2020, as I was telling you at uh, the outset of this uh, presentation, you are really having a front row seat to the international birth 
corporate birth of this uh, company, uh, the company of the Guatemala Interoceanic uh, um, Corridor, a company that is planning to uh, have its uh, initial private offering at the New York Stock Exchange before 2021 ends. Right now, we're at an equity raising phase in which uh, we're selling shares at a discount and uh, um, establishing the strategic alliances with uh, um, the key uh, partners we want to have in this project. Please, the next slide. Uh, these, uh, these, uh, uh, this project is already known by um, different uh, uh, um, institutions from the development finance world, such as the IDB and the former OPIC, which is now the DFC. Uh, in the, uh, the fo in following months of 2020, we hope to uh, advance in this direction because we have to still uh, uh, finalize a cer certain legal local processes. We have to identify uh, and engage uh, the financial and strategic allies that we want to have, get to the final engineering designs for which we have already established uh, preliminary uh, talks with uh, uh, Georgia Institute of Technology in the United States. And uh, we hope that um, this is going to uh, gain track and, and become uh, uh, the largest project in the history of Guatemala sometime very soon. Please, the next slide. This is going to be accomplished by what we call a rare tropical bird. Uh, it's going to be uh, accomplished by a company, a private company that is non-traditional we already have more than 3,000 uh, small uh, shareholders uh, uh, and, and many other stakeholders. So in this regard, uh, we're very uh, non-traditional for Guatemala. It's a socially inclusive, environmentally aware, and economically profitable proposition. It's going to be Guatemala because it's based in Guatemala and it's going to be controlled by Guatemala entrepreneurs. But Guatemala entrepreneurs that are conscious that this project is going to have very heavy strategic responsibilities and it must be open to all flags. It's, as I said, a private company, but we're not allergic to governmental participation. In fact, we are planning to have all regional governments become minority shareholders in the company, in particular, the countries of, of course, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Mexico, and the United States. Uh, and it's going to be an ongoing concern. We're not talking here about something that is going to begin and finish with a sale. We are here in this corporate structure for the long haul. We hope this is going to become a regional institution, a permanent regional institution. Please, the next slide. In general, as uh, I said before, this is uh, a company that is being built with uh, uh, a socially inclusive set of mind. It has uh, uh, already a political and social base, a very strong one, in which uh, we uh, are um, the beneficiaries of um, um, hopes of a lot of people, of uh, uh, the confidence, the trust of a lot of people, including not only small owners uh, of land, but also uh, municipalities, um, indigenous uh, communities, uh, rural communities, uh, and, and also organizations uh, of uh, municipalities. Uh, we hope to power the transportation with uh, solar and wind powered energy uh, and that will um, feed uh, batteries, uh, uh, which will be really what will propel uh, our containers across the isthmus in both directions. And as I said before, even though it's going to be a proudly Guatemalan company, it's going to be open to all flags and it's going to welcome the participation of our neighboring uh, brotherly countries. Please, the next slide. Mr. Zoriello, we need to close your presentation as soon as possible. Yes. Okay, well, so um, right now we're at the process where we're uh, finalizing the, the uh, equity uh, raising and uh, you will have the next slide, please. Next slide. It's just uh, uh, the next one. We have here, uh, the next slide. 
uh, we have here uh, the addresses, the um, electronic addresses where you can find out more about this project. We will welcome this. The next slide, please. Uh, and the next one uh, directly. Uh, we will connect this international corridor um, by this uh, system of um, uh, hanging mono uh, rails uh, to uh, the existing uh, highways of uh, uh, Guatemala that con connect in Salvador and Mexico and then Honduras. And, uh, the inner part of the country. So um, thank you very much for your uh, attention and uh, we hope to hear from you sometime soon. Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Mr. Torrello. Um Now let's try to go back to Rosana from Honduras to uh, give her, her updates on projects there. Rosana, are you there? Hello. We can hear you. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian, and good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure being here today. So I will provide a general quick overview of the Honduran market, information on leading industry sectors, and also current developments and initiatives pertaining to infrastructure. Um, next slide, please. I'd like to start highlighting that Honduras is an open economy enjoying a privileged geographic position in the heart of the Americas. It has a diverse geographic territory about the size of Pennsylvania or Tennessee, only two to three hours away from the US by air and 48 to 72 hours by sea. It is very close to the ports and production centers in North America. It is also home to four seaports in a specific and Atlantic coasts, among them Puerto Cortez, among the most important in the region and the only deep water port in Central America with international certifications and recognized as a model for port security through CBP's Container Security Initiative. Puerto Cortes is also included in the Megaport program, providing 24-hour service year-round. So all of this has an impact on lower logistical costs for import-export. And Honduras is considered a distribution platform in Central America. It is also linked to Arcos, Maya, and Emergia underwater cable systems, among others. And it offers the latest wireless fiber optic and microwave technologies, including uh, making it one of the best uh, connected countries in the region. Population growth is approximately 1.6% annually, and an estimated 2.2 of the population are, are distributed in urban areas such as Tegucigalpa, the capital city, and San Pedro Sula, the country's commercial hub and industrial center. It also has the largest bilingual population in the region. Its business climate has been supported by a favorable economic performance and a commitment on enhanced macroeconomic stability and fiscal consolidation with a stable exchange rate, which has floated in a band system since 2011 and a moderate one-digit inflation rate. Um, right now, uh, an economic contraction resulting from COVID, uh, it, is, uh, it is estimated that, well, average GDP growth in Honduras has been 3.73 historically in the, in the past years. It is estimated that as, uh, post-pandemic, it may drop to 5.5% uh, by year 2020. Next slide, please. So um, among the traditional priority industry sectors or clusters for economic growth and development where Honduras has been identified as having competitive advantages, as well as emerging business sectors and best prospects for U.S. exports are agribusiness, which represents 45% of the country's GDP and over 60% of its exports. Honduras is also a leader in the Western Hemisphere in textile products. Uh, most of this manufacturing is located in the export processing zones. And uh, the country is also engaged in the assembly of automotive and electronic components. It has also been characterized by one of the fastest growing uh, business process outsourcing and ITO hubs driven by uh, young bilingual talent. And tourism is seen as an important source or has been seen as an important source of economic growth with um, 650 kilometers of beaches and the second largest coral reef in the world, ancient Mayan, Mayan ruins and rainforest. 
In terms of critical infrastructure, ICT is becoming very important as the government pursues technological transformation to simplify and automate government processes through a digital government and innovation initiative. It also uh, includes a national broadband plan and deployment of infrastructure that allows connectivity to all municipalities in Honduras to reduce the digital gap between urban and rural areas. Another critical infrastructure sector is energy. The country is undergoing an important and complex reform process to address structural challenges, strengthen energy policy, and support regional electricity integration. In the area of healthcare, telemedicine and medical devices are among the best prospects. Improvement of healthcare delivery systems is very critical, particularly in today's um, context of the pandemic. And other active, very active sectors include safety and security, environmental technologies as it pertains to water, wastewater, solid waste and recycling, and food processing and packaging. Next slide, please. Infrastructure development is undoubtedly a big priority. The country has invested important resources in modernizing its infrastructure. There is a vision to improve its logistical performance and become a key supplier of logistical services in Latin America. Completion of various roads and highway corridors um, and the overland interconnection of the ports are aimed to consolidate the country as a leading provider of logistical services. Also, um, a new airport, uh, Palmerola Airport, located in the Comayagua Valley, about one hour from the capital city, is in its final construction stage, and is seen uh, with great possibilities of uh, becoming an important distribution and logistical service center. Um, so, among the main infrastructure project initiatives um, are roads, with an estimated spending of 474 million, including 3,500 kilometers of new roadways and rehabilitation works of around 1,500 kilometers of existing motorways. The program also includes a road heritage component focused on paved and unpaved roads. It is worth mentioning that in order to facilitate large-scale investments, Honduras is also working on the institutional strengthening of its public-private partnership capacities and framework. And there has been solid progress in incorporating the private sector in investments, which historically had been reserved for the government. There are also plans for investments in social infrastructure that includes the construction of a new trauma hospital in the capital city, as well as the construction of facilities for a women's city center where women who are victims of violence can access a program of uh, different services as well as construction of affordable housing units in sustainable communities for families whose incomes are less than half minimum, half a minimum wage. Another immediate focus is building up transmission energy infrastructure. Uh, due to decades of underinvestment, the transmission system is actually in, it's, uh, currently in poor condition. So Honduras is moving forward with a national electric energy transmission line program. Um, financed by the IDB. There is currently an international public bid process. Another um, and very important strategic regional initiative with um, Honduras involvement is also the power grid expansion of the Central American Electrical Interconnection mm -hmm. System, CEPAC. The second phase uh, of the construction of this transmission line connecting over 37 million consumers in the region will require an investment of 128 million and is being um, supported by the Central American Bank for Economic Integration. At present, um, Honduras utilizes variable renewable, ener uh, variable renewable energy for over 60% of its generation. And technical experts agree that the country needs to increase firm power capacity in order to maintain grid stability. So to address the shortage, of firm power and satisfy current demand, demand the government plans to uh, potentially issue uh, power tenders in 2021 or 2022 of potentially up to 600 megawatts. The entry of natural gas technologies is on the radar, particularly to satisfy uh, peak demand in the northern region of Honduras. 
um, in the capital, industrial capital, San Pedro Sula. The municipalities of San Pedro Sula and Puerto Cortes have uh, been engaging uh, very actively, very actively in smart cities um, initiatives. Also, a tender uh, for the three air international airports of San Pedro Sula, Roatan, and La Ceiba um, are considered for next year. Port development and modernization. Um, there's a master plan for development, developing port infrastructure in southern Honduras and modernizing uh, the port of San Lorenzo. Other initiatives include the port the Port of Castilla and also a dry port logistics park. Realizing the economic uh, impact that the pandemic will have, Honduras um, is also considering supporting regional transportation infrastructure initiatives to improve sustainable competitiveness, uh, which includes a trinational ferry covering Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, uh, sustainable mobility regional program and cargo and interoceanic regional railway. These are collective initi uh, transportation initiatives that would also reduce carbon emissions and contribute to more resilience in the region's transportation sector. Um, the government is also attempting to create special economic development zones and um, has in created a law on zones for employment and economic development. Um, similar to those in Asia as uh, special investment districts to attract investment and growth in an accelerated way. Um, having their own legal, economic, and ad administrative regimes, this places them beyond the traditional concept that we know uh, locally of free zones or, or maquilas. So feasibility studies um, are underway for implementation of an economic development zone in the Gulf of Fonseca in southern Honduras. Uh, this concludes my, my presentation, and as you explore business opportunities in Honduras, please don't hesitate to reach out to us for further information, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Rosana. That was, that was a lot of information. That was perfect. Um, so now we will go back to Eric Wolf to give us a little bit more information about the DEAL teams, which is a, a regional initiative in Central America. Eric? Yeah. Hey, uh, thank you, Brian. Um, no, uh, great job, everyone. And and I just want to take a quick minute. Um, you know, now that we've heard a little bit about uh, specific infrastructure opportunities in Central America, actually, we project over the next um, uh, uh, 24 months uh, potential of, of upwards of eight billion dollars of investment, um, uh, which is which is notable. I do want to take a minute uh, to talk about a very important initiative called Deal Team. Um, it's no secret that uh, there are certain uh, competitors out there in the world, in particular in parts of Asia, uh, that um, uh, have used non-market-based tools to advance their uh, diplomatic and strategic goals in other parts of the world, including uh, Western Hemisphere, uh, using debt diplomacy and other tools. So the key thing is the United States um, has formed a new initiative uh, that uh, the, 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 the larger one is called America Crece, the Growth in America's Initiative. And under this, DEAL team mobilizes many parts of the, of the U.S. government to go after these uh, infrastructure projects in a much more proactive way and in the process promoting a much more market-based total cost of ownership higher quality um, outcome. So um, our embassy teams, and really led by uh, many of the specialists, these specialists that you've heard here on this call, uh, Ricardo and Rosana, Maria, Libby, Antonio, uh, they have their, their eyes and ears and boots on the ground in country uh, and regularly track forthcoming projects. Um, and, and really, our goal is to, within the U.S. Commercial Service, to con connect many of you um, on this call, U.S. exporters, uh, who may be interested in bidding or being part of uh, a consortium that may be uh, coming together to bid on um, uh, some of these projects that are, again, in rail, they're in port, they're in airport, uh, ICT, smart cities, border management, the list goes on. You know, it's interesting that although COVID has clearly impacted 
uh, most sectors, just about every sector in some way. Um, there's some that still um, have uh, uh, continue to grow, and and we see significant opportunity. Things like logistics uh, and security. Um, uh, you know, uh, drug traffickers uh, have not taken a holiday uh, because of the pandemic, and the uh, the flow of illegal drugs through our region is crazy. Uh, and um, you know, a lot of the very technologies that we're seeing. Uh, in some of these projects go after major national security goals uh, that touch upon security. So I do want to talk a little bit about uh, the financing and advocacy tools. And, and um, uh, in fact, next slide, please. Our, our ultimate goal is to be more proactive, increase transparency, uh, remove barriers, and mobilize um, uh, uh, companies to come together to, uh, to bid on these projects. So um, Deal Team America Crazy is truly an interagency U.S. government initiative. Uh, we, the, you know, uh, the, the spe trade specialists on this phone, myself, uh, within the Foreign Commercial Service, we are just part of this. Uh, many other U.S. government agencies, including State, Treasury, USAID, uh, Agriculture, MCC, and others, uh, have signed on to this greater initiative. In fact, uh, there is recently been called what's called a D.C. Central Deal Team, where at very high levels in the U.S. US government, uh, we are uh, uh, collaborating and strategizing on ways to align U.S. government resources, uh, provide financing where needed, uh, and facilitate discussions with, uh, with allies. Now, um, just, uh, I, I just want to mention before I, I move on to the Q&A, a couple of key groups. U.S. Trade Development Agency is an amazing group uh, that funds feasibility studies for conceptual work in many of these key sectors that we've been talking about, such as ICT, such as transportation and others, uh, a very, very important partner that we have strong connections with. Uh, Exim Bank, um, uh, the ex Export-Import Bank of the United States, we have very, very good connections with them, key deal team partner. They have been, for the past um, uh, nearly 100 years, providing loan guarantees and financing uh, for U.S. exports. I think it came up on this call, uh, the group that many of you used to uh, known, be known as OPIC, um, was recently, under the BUILD Act uh, of about a year and a half ago, renamed the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, or the IFTC, uh, International Finance Development Corporation, excuse me, the IFTC, uh, for short, um, that is specifically there to um, provide financing for development projects. Uh, and there are very significant commitments in terms of financing. We've had uh, 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 MOUs signed with uh, DFC and the governments of many of the governments in Central America to move this forward. In addition, it was mentioned on this call, IDB, uh, CABE, the World Bank, um, the, we're very in very close contact with other finance banks uh, that play a role in this, and um, uh, the key thing is collaboration. So again, um, uh, this is a partnership. We this is a cross-functional team. In fact, I will even say that, that the folks that you heard on this call, we have our own deal team group that where we collaborate internally. We're here to help you. Uh, and I just wanted to mention that um, if you have any specific questions about some of the projects that you've heard, uh, please contact one of us, and we'd be happy to go further um, and talk a little bit more in granularity about this specific opportunity. So again, with that, I will stop my comments um, and turn things back over to Brian to facilitate Q&A. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, so that is all for, of our presenters for today. Um, we do have a couple questions in the queue. If you, if anybody has questions, please remember to type them into the Q and A uh, box on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, while we wait for a couple more questions to come in, um, I will take a minute. Uh, just um, you know, as I mentioned, this has been uh, just an introduction to some of the infrastructure opportunities in Central America. Um, as well as some, you know, many of the resources at your at your disposal as your firms continue exploring these opportunities. Um, this was the last uh, webinar in this infrastructure webinar series. Um, 
but we do, you know, again, it will be it will be recorded um, and we'll be sending out uh, the recording instructions to download the recording along with all of the slides that you saw today. Um, we'll be sending that out in, in the coming days. Um, one last thing, as Eric mentioned, you know, our, our network of experienced officers and specialists in the Western Hemisphere here welcomes connecting with you via email, conference calls, uh, video conference, or, you know, any, any form of communication uh, to discuss your international business plans and answer any questions that you might have. Um, so now I think we can go on to the questions. Our first question I think was for uh, Mr. Torriello. Um, and the question is, what uh, what is the time to transport time of, I guess, basically the question is, can you compare, you know, the time it would take to transport along uh, the, the Guatemala corridor versus how long it would take to transport uh, through the Panama Canal? Basically, uh, it would take from six to eight hours if there were ships on both sides ready. Uh, however, we're prepared uh, for the uh, usual uh, mismatch of uh, ship arrivals, so containers can rest in the corridor while their ship is ready. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, the next question, I believe, is for Rosana in Honduras. Um, could you please provide a little more detail on the transmission line project in terms of the scope of the project for the electrical generation and distribution? Um, yes, so as mentioned, um, the government of Honduras is building up uh, its transmission infrastructure due to um, decades of underinvestment. Um, December 2019, for example, uh, a transmission failure in Honduras caused a worldwide uh, blackout, impacting millions from Nicaragua to southern Mexico. So this would be um, a, a very important um, step uh, to strengthen uh, not only the uh, local transmission line, but um, as as the region pursues uh, the expansion of the regional uh, interconnection grid, um, this will add a um, uh, new capacity. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Rosanna. Um, next question, could projects of technology for public safety be financed? Uh, I'm not sure specifically who that question is for, but I know that I think El Salvador talked about some public safety projects. Maria, do you know if uh, they could be financed? Hey, Brian, this is Eric. Yeah. Hey, Eric. Um, yeah, I can answer that generally. Obviously, okay. uh, every project um, that um, uh, is it has its own specific characteristics. So, for instance, XM Bank or DXC. Uh, this is something where we can help facilitate discussions, and it really comes down to uh, a lot of the due diligence they do on, on the projects. But broadly speaking, yes. I mean, security uh, is, uh, NICT, uh, is a specific area that, um, uh, whether it's DFC or TDA, um, at the US, U.S. government in general sees as a very important sector um, and uh, uh, that, uh, again, it's case by case, but uh, this is something that a lot of our partners would consider for financing. Okay, great. Thanks, Eric. Next question, again, I think this one is for Mr. Torriello. Um, can you please provide more detail about the Georgia Tech participation in the Interoceanic Corridor Project? As you uh, may imagine, uh, there are several technical issues that need to be solved before a project of this size and nature can be brought to life. So we want to uh, reach um, the uh, best sources of technological knowledge in the world, and the Georgia Institute of Technology is known for its uh, specific uh, expertise in logistics. So we have been um, having some uh, very informal uh, first talks with uh, the uh, tech's uh, industrial engineering department uh, to uh, start to um, come to some conclusions as to how they could transfer 
technology to this uh, company. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, next question again is for Rosana, and the, this participant is asking who they would contact for the um, Honduras Energy Project. Uh, should they be reaching out to you directly, or uh, is they said is it E N E E? Rosana, are you there still? Uh, yes, uh, they can Sorry. come to our office for information on the uh, different energy energy projects. Um, as currently the energy utility is, um, as mentioned, undergoing some structural reforms and there is um, an intervention com committee reviewing um, reviewing the different projects. Okay, great. Um, and since Rosanna mentioned it, uh, when we send out the slides and the recording of this webinar, uh, we'll include the contact information for the um, for our specialists in each country, um, and you know, as well as a link where um, anybody can find and locate their local uh, U.S. Export Assistance Center. Um, we did have one other question. For it says, are all P3 proposals done in on open bid, or can you provide unsolicited proposals for negotiation? This. Somebody want to answer that question on a general level? Uh, Eric, Ricardo, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what P3 proposal is. <laughs> yeah, this is Eric. I can jump in and then maybe, um, you know, Ricardo, Rosanna, if you want to come in. So a public-private partnership, a uh, very common model uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, throughout, many, yeah, throughout many parts of the world and also here in, in Central America. I mean, the short answer is that they should be going to bid uh, clearly, we do have some uh, partners that, uh, you know, other other countries, other nations that try to short, short circuit the transparent negotiation process. Um, um, uh, but but again, there are I, I would defer a bit to our individual um, uh, in-country deal team leads. Uh, there are some projects that are being considered for the P3 model. Uh, it is a proven model for certain types of infrastructure projects. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, I, I would just say that, I don't know, Ricardo, Rosanna, if, if either of you want to maybe jump in on that, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Eric. In the case of Costa Rica, the the module that the, we are have seen in the, with the Costa Rica government is they require um, uh, registration, a previous registration of the companies interested in the public partner um, and, the, and the private public uh, partnership, and they receive the information from the uh, Costa Rica government entity that is managing the process. Great, great, thank you both. Um, we do have another question. I, I believe it's more. Um, well, it's, a, it's kind of a specific to a certain company, but in terms of advocacy on um, some of these, you know, larger tenders or, or government, you know, projects, um, do Eric, do you want to touch on kind of what what sort of support we can give U.S. companies that are having issues when they feel like maybe they're not being treated fairly in, in a tender? Yeah, I'd be happy to, Brian. So. Um, yeah, the, the advocacy uh, process is, is a long-standing um, uh, uh, process that's, that has been run out of the Department of Commerce, the Advocacy Center, for many, many years. And it's a proven um, uh, approach, uh, basically, where we, and it's government to government. So basically, where we see a tender that's forthcoming, um, uh, where we... Um, uh, the, and there's some interest from the United States uh, side in terms of a private company that wants to bid on this. Um, they apply for advocacy. It's completely free. Uh, uh, if, 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 again, talk to our trade specialists, they, they have direct connections to the advocacy center. You fill out a very quick questionnaire. Once you're cleared, then there's a whole lot of things we can do. We can um, uh, deploy our, our, our ambassadors throughout the region who are very influential. Many times, depending on, and these tend to be larger projects that are in the millions of dollars. Uh, depending on the size, depending on the importance of the project, sometimes we can get senior level um, uh, officials 
within uh, uh, Department of Commerce or other agencies too. And they can basically knock on the door uh, to their counterpart in the host government, the decision maker, and say, uh, we're aware of, of a, comp- a company or companies that are bidding on this particular project. And again, we can't uh, uh, prejudice one U.S. firm against another, but we can just say, we really want you to take a hard look at this. Uh, and, and having served in the uh, uh, foreign commercial service for close to 20 years, I can attest to the fact that this gets results uh, when they see a, a USG uh, uh, senior official just come and kind of just gently knock on the door and say, hey, take a look at this. So uh, we're happy to provide there. This advocacy is, is a part of the whole deal team strategy. And this, I think, it helps underscore that it doesn't prejudice the, the specific tool that we're going to use. So hopefully, Brian, that answers the question. Great. Yeah, that was, that was great. Um, we had another question asking specifically about, uh, you know, which which of these countries on the webinar today um, are in, you know, in need of either water or electricity uh, projects specifically. Um, and in the background, I, you know, Honduras, Costa Rica, and and Guatemala. I'll kind of mention it. Do you guys, one of you guys, want to mention quickly some of the water electricity projects you might have uh, in the pipeline? Uh, Brian, this is Ricardo from Costa Rica. We have learned in the, in the, the, the interest of Costa Rica to do some uh, water treatment plants, uh, most for residual waters, but uh, also can be uh, identified other, other projects. But uh, we are not sure at this moment the priority uh, or, or the changes in priority as a result of the pandemic. But uh, we'll be more than glad to work with the companies interested uh, in and, and uh, send us an email, and we'll work uh, to provide the proper information. Okay, great. Um, and I think that goes for you know, for any of the countries, or you know, I guess uh, anybody listening. You know, if you are in a certain industry or you have a certain specific product, as we mentioned before, you know, you can reach out to your local export assistance center, um, and they'll be happy to do an assessment with you. Uh, you know, if you're trying to figure out which country, you know, your product is best suited to, um, we can certainly help you with that, um, uh, or, or countries, plural, um, as well as, you know, uh, get you in touch with, with any countries identified that, that have specific uh, needs for, for your product. Um, another question for Eric here, I think as sort of a follow-up to what you mentioned previously, but is there a region-wide estimate uh, regarding the effect of the, that the pandemic will have on the economy? Do you, do you know of that of anything of that sort? Yeah, this is Eric. I, I don't have any specific numbers to share. Uh, I believe Maria mentioned an estimate that um, I, I, I cannot recall the exact number, but I was thinking that it's probably representative of, of the region. I, I, I can tell you again, um, we're going to know uh, in the here hopefully uh, shortly in the next few months exactly what the impact of this pandemic has been. Uh, it clearly has had a major impact uh, economically upon Central America. Uh, we've had, I'm sorry, a truck is going by here. Um, so I may get a little loud. <clears throat> we've had uh, border closures uh, periodically uh, and, uh, uh, and other uh, <clears throat> impacts upon the economies. Uh, and in fact, certain markets have had um, uh, a very dramatic impact in, in changes in production in certain sectors. <clears throat> Our hope is that clearly once this pandemic is over, that um, things will get back to normal, whatever that new normal looks like, uh, and we'll be able to look, look back. But again, I think the main message that I want to put out to you is look at the opportunities, right? Um, and and um, this is not <clears throat> going to be just a negative. There will be some sectors that uh, and several have been mentioned that are excuse me, benefit quite a bit from this. I'll leave it at that. Okay, great. Thanks, Eric. All right, well, I think that is it for questions for today. Um, So again, we'll be sending out the recording of this webinar um, and all the presentations along with with contact info of the specialists that that presented today. Um, So you're welcome to reach out to them or again, your Export Assistance Center. 
Um, so yeah, thank you to all of our presenters. This was a, a wealth of information. Um, I'm sure it will be useful to, to anybody on the call today. Um, I hope everybody stays safe and has a nice day. Thank you very much.